Thank you, Justin. What a great couple of days this has been. I feel sort of like the caboose on a very long train. Let's see if we can get the computers switched over here so we can get the Mac up. Let's see. Whoop. Good. Done. Thank you. Uh, so I think in the spirit of being um, the caboose, um, maybe that's not the right metaphor, but let's take the next hour to sort of, or a little less, to kind of review what we've heard over the last couple of days. I did these slides before the, uh, I knew what we were going to hear, but they actually, I think, do a pretty good job of summarizing some of the major issues, which I'll divide up into the hurt, the hype, and the hope. Um, there might be other H's that could go in that train, but these are the three that I've decided to use as sort of organizing principles. Um, by, by way of introduction, just to say, as Justin just mentioned, I am a part owner of MindStrong Health and have equity in a number of tech companies, and I will actually talk about some of the products from various companies, including uh, some of the uh, both for-profit and non-profit boards I belong to, like Seven Cups and uh, I don't think we'll get into talking about others, but just so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, so let's start by just, and I'm going to go through this very quickly because we've heard so much of this already about what is the problem we're trying to solve? Why are we worried about um, having to disrupt this field? You know, what's the challenge? And that's what I call the hurt, and you've already seen in various forms, versions of this slide that suggest the very high disability or morbidity from neuropsychiatric disorders, which many people have said are going to become the leading source of disability. But in fact, if you combine neuropsychiatric disorders as a group, they are already and were in 2010 when these data were collected as part of the burden of disease study, the leading source of burden of disease. And some of that really has to do with their time of onset, because burden of disease has a lot to do with uh, the disability over time. And the, the critical thing here to note, the red line is the mental and behavioral disorders, and these are disorders of the first half of life. And it's just extraordinary how much of the disability before age 50 is explained by this group of illnesses. Uh, and that actually, for the world of technology, is a real opportunity because those are that's also the generation that's most embraced um, the use of smartphones and other uh, technology tools. It's not just a problem when we talk about the hurt or the challenge. It's not simply morbidity. Mortality is a huge issue for us in terms of suicide. Um, you can see here that um, the number of suicides, as um, both uh, Matt Nock and others have talked about, is uh, in excess of 40,000 per year. Uh, I think it's been on a couple of other people's slides, but just to... Uh, remind you that that number of 40,000 is higher than the number of breast cancer deaths, higher than the, number of, than the number of prostate cancer deaths. It's really quite extraordinary, those numbers. And as Matt mentioned, what's maybe most vexing for us is that these, this number hasn't really changed. There have been changes in the demographics of suicide, so groups that have come up, groups that have gone down. But overall, uh, we're looking at very, very high rates. These are U.S. numbers. The U.S. actually isn't the leading um, in terms of in this particular measure in terms of the rate. Uh, we're sort of in the middle globally, but it gives you some sense of the burden because even in the U.S., which has very high homicide numbers, we're at about threefold higher uh, than the homicide number for suicides, which is just stunning uh, because people don't seem to know that. And by the way, that ratio of suicide to homicide is actually much higher in other countries. I think in Australia, where I was last year, was about 10 to 1. So this is really um, such an extraordinary public health problem. Uh, this last couple of months, you probably wouldn't have paid as much attention to um, suicide because it's been so focused um, on the opiate epidemic. And for good reasons, those numbers are now just extraordinary. Um, the number of 64,000, again, to put that in context, that's higher than the number of deaths from HIV at the height of the AIDS epidemic in 1995, 
we were losing about 50,000 people to AIDS, 52,000, something like that. So we've actually well surpassed that number for uh, opiate deaths, which is extraordinary. And then finally, in addition to morbidity and mortality, we always talk about costs, and you've seen numbers like this already, but as just a, an extraordinary economic burden in addition to the emotional loss uh, that, that we're dealing with. So what I want to take just a minute to talk about with you is how did this happen? Why has it been so difficult to, to bend the curve here? And why have we not been able um, to, to do better? I think Holly Lisenby in her talk actually kind of said, this is not a race we want to win. We don't want to be number one on any of these metrics. And why is it that we're still stuck in that, that, that at the top of the morbidity and mortality charts? And I don't think there's a single answer for that. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. We've heard little bits of it in the last couple of days. Um, let me try to capture what I see as maybe the major issues and then where that's going to lead in terms of the rest of what I want to talk to you about. And what I want you to be thinking about is where would technology fit in to trying to address these reasons for not being able to bend the curve? How do we fix this? Are there, is there an app for this? That's kind of the bottom line of what I want to help you think about. So the first thing to say is that, um, and, and Teresa actually referred to this, is that the extraordinary thing is that most people are not in treatment. If you look at the 10 million people with serious mental illness or the sort of uh, 44 million, and this isn't even counting the substance abuse population, um, what you see is about 40% uh, are in treatment. And of those, about 40% are getting what we would consider minimally acceptable care. And depending on the disorder, maybe a third, third to a half, slightly more than that, probably respond. And there's still another third for most of our disorders who aren't responding. Now, this is really um, a difficult thing for us to contend with, I think. And, and uh, especially you know, when we take we have this kind of conversation with um, McLean and the ITP. You know, this, the struggle is you're largely talking about the 40% who have come into treatment. But when we ask the question about morbidity and mortality, we have to think about this as a population problem. And that in the United States even, where we have actually large numbers of providers, good or bad, uh, we still have more than half the people not accessing care. One of the reasons, for instance, why it's been so difficult to bend this curve on suicide is that 60% of people die on their first attempt. And most of those people were not in treatment. We never saw them before they killed themselves. That's not true for cancer. That's not true for heart disease. It's certainly not true for diabetes or hypertension. So... Most of this is happening outside of our view. And it begs the question that we want to come back to later about why that is. Why is it that whatever it is we're selling, people aren't buying it? You know, it was in Teresa's data as well. Most people, with the, even people who score highly on these screening tests and who really have fairly serious symptoms, enough to die from these problems because of the suicide issue, are not coming into treatment. Or at least they're not coming into treatment with us. So a question I'll put out there, just leave it hanging for now. Is there a way that technology can help with that? Um, not by necessarily linking those people to the brick and mortar system that we have, but is there something else that we should think about building that could begin the, to bend the curve, could get people support and help in some way that doesn't involve the current system which people do not want to use? For those who do get involved, it's sort of usually uh, the last resort, right? They, we know that the length of time between the onset of illness, which is almost always before age 25, and getting treatment is very long. And perhaps the best example of that would be today in the people who have one of the most severe forms of mental illness, schizophrenia, or uh, any of the psychotic disorders where 
You can see this canonical graph of the loss of psychosocial functioning, which happen, happens even before psychosis onset. But the point here is to remind you that most of what we do uh, in our brick and mortar system is to see people out here when they've already had um, a considerable amount of psychosocial dysfunction and often are in what we would call stage four of a chronic illness. Obviously where we want to be is a much, much earlier in the process. And again, the question is, is there a technological approach that could get us upstream from where we've been? Uh, just to, get, to give you a number to think about, the, from the Ray study, NIMH funded 38 sites uh, in 21 states, looking at uh, early uh, psychosis and first episode. Uh, the duration of untreated psychosis there was 74 weeks. Now, this is not like in the 1990s. We're talking about in the last five years. So this is new data. And it's still a year and a half of people being psychotic before they get diagnosed and treated, which is extraordinary. And it's probably related to that very high suicide number. So in a way, I mean, for me, those two things, the kind of lack of treatment and the, um, the delay are sort of the quantity problems. The other side of this is the quality issues that um, we have real issues with the quality of care that is provided and the people who get treatment. This national, uh, this Institute of Medicine, now it's called the National Academy of Medicine report um, that was funded largely by NIMH and SAMHSA looked at uh, what is the problem with quality. And I won't go through all of that, but it's definitely worth looking at the report. One point was that we don't measure. Uh, and the lack of measurement is a, such a big issue. And one of the reasons we haven't done better is because when people aren't getting well, we often don't know that. And actual studies that have been done of this fact show that uh, only about 21% of the time do we actually know, uh, does the clinician recognize that the patient hasn't improved? Because there's no, me there's no measurement of that fact. And patients often are... Um, telling clinicians this and clinicians aren't getting it or patients are often or sometimes not telling them uh, because the, the question isn't asked. It's obvious to anyone in this room that this is an area where care is extraordinarily fragmented. You just heard about issues that had to do just with the conveyance of information between um, substance abuse, mental health, and general, uh, general health, which is a huge problem really incredible. It's not something that happens between your endocrinologist and your oncologist, but there's just, you know, the, essentially substance abuse information is used as uh, like criminal information. It's very difficult to have that shared across the medical system. And even more remarkably, you know, you can go to any university and you'll find a counseling center, which is providing mental health care, and a health center, which could be even in the same building, and yet there are no links between those two even though many of the kids being seen in the counseling center are on a whole range of medications that would require some pretty serious uh, medical management. So fragmentation uh, continues to be a huge issue. And then finally, as other people have mentioned through the, through the last couple of days, um, what we do is very reactive, very crisis oriented. Uh, Mark Olson's paper is really worth looking at where he looked at you know, how we do on the various HEDIS measures of quality and in that case, that it, when you look at uh, ER visits for self-harm, I just find this incredible, that only 52% of people have had a follow-up visit within 30 days of being in the emergency room. That's just amazing to me. It's hard to believe that when you go to the emergency room for uh, anything from uh, chest pain to a fractured leg, that there wouldn't be a follow-up visit within uh, 30 days. But in the case of self-harm, uh, it doesn't happen. So these are all, I think, uh, significant issues. Just to summarize, uh, this is, I think, the, and, and I'm sure there are other issues. People often bring up stigma at this point, and that sort of infuses all of these issues. But from, from my vantage point, the ones that we can begin to attack, uh, including stigma, are here. This lack of treatment, the delay for those who get treatment, and then the quality of care. I, I would also... Um, suggest to you that underlying 
all of these besides the stigma issue is this kind of fundamental issue with measurement. The fact that, um, as we often say, we can't manage what we can't measure, and if we don't measure, we don't manage. Um, and so uh, one of the places where I'm going to um, sort of push, I think, for all of us is that we make sure that getting uh, high-quality, consistent, reliable, standardized, objective measures could be one of the things that would be the most powerful way of transforming this field. And uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that. But that leads me then to talk about uh, the next piece of this, which uh, I, I call this the hype only because it starts with an H. I actually want to think that hype is a very good thing at this point. This is an early uh, phase of what I think is going to be a really fantastic field. But I think we should be realistic. Often uh, what the way I would say this is that it's good as long as it lasts. Um, the sort of canonical hype curve that you see here. I'm not sure exactly where we are in this. Um, maybe judging from uh, the enthusiasm at this meeting, we're still in this peak of inflated expectations. And part of what I would like to do in the next few minutes is to uh, not to take us into the trough of disillusionment, but at least try to manage expectations a little bit and think with you about what do we really know? What have we really seen? Where are we? As someone yesterday, um, and I'm not going to remember who it was, said, you know, we're at a moment where we've shown feasibility but not efficacy. And I think that's a great, I think it was JP who said this, and I think that's a really good uh, kind of description of where we are. We've got now lots of opportunity, lots of creativity, lots of ambition out there. Um, but there's, um, it's also important now to begin to say, okay, what is this actually able to do? So, um, my, and some of you have seen this slide before, but my real quick summary of where we are in this world, uh, and just to kind of capture everything you've heard in the last couple of days, is that there's sort of three different areas where technology is beginning to really have an impact. One is on this assessment side, what we call digital phenotyping, and you heard about that a lot from JP and from others yesterday. That's the sensors, human-computer interaction is how you use the keyboard, uh, voice and speech, uh, measuring sociality through metadata, number of emails out versus emails in, texts out versus texts in, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, you've heard already a lot about what that looks like, and you've seen some of the data from that. Uh, the big space, of course, is around interventions, and that's where most of the work has gone on, um, taking manualized skill-based therapies and putting them online, putting them on, uh, onto phones, uh, developing coaching, peer support, uh, you heard in the last session about crisis text line and the opportunity to do, or I guess it was the previous session, crisis intervention. So there's a lot there. And then finally, the ability to coordinate with electronic health records, do new kinds of quality metrics, data capture. All this is happening. There are both public and private efforts all around this space. There's a whole bunch of different ways of putting this together to create the kind of learning healthcare system that we were just talking about. This becomes a learning engine and the really exciting piece of this, and I think where the great promise and opportunity is, is to finally begin to measure the impact of what we're doing so we can begin to titrate up and down uh, just like you were in any other part of medicine. You increase the dose or you decrease it uh, based on what the uh, response is, and you're actually uh, learning as you go and figure out how to do this. The technologies involved are, you know, vast at this point. You've got the apps and sensors and a whole bunch of AI tools for, uh, on the diagnostic side or the assessment side for the interventions. Uh, you already heard a lot about telehealth, um, and we didn't have a presentation specifically on VR, but the use of VR for, especially for exposure therapy, uh, AR, of course, you've heard a lot about it, AI, and we also didn't talk in the last couple of days about video games, but enormous interest in several companies that are now pushing on the use of um, pretty high-level games for cognitive training and for a range of other kinds of interventions. Uh, and then a, the ability to build dashboards and databases and, and all of this stuff for data integration, which is uh, super interesting. Uh, I'm going to go a little deeper into this first part of it, the digital phenotyping, um, partly because, as I said, I do think that getting better measurement um, is going to be the foundation for everything else we do. 
because it will tell us which one of these intervention, interventions is working and how they're working. And as you've heard from others, and I'm not going to spend uh, any time, I don't have to because other people have said it, what we do today just isn't working, whether it's with the PHQ-9, a self-rating, or whether objective ratings, we're just, we're just not capturing. And you saw some great examples of that yesterday about when people are actually doing more careful measurement than a question like this on the PHQ-9 about how have you been feeling over the last two weeks turns out to be almost laughably inaccurate. Nobody can answer that question accurately. Uh, and usually when you're reporting out, you're talking about the last two hours or three hours. There's a huge recency effect. Um, and self ratings are notoriously inaccurate uh, in depression in, in any case. So that's not working for us. And um, the kind of thing that I think all of us are looking for is um, having measurements that are objective, continuous, ubiquitous, proactive. Uh, and I should add to this, in situ rather than in a lab. So uh, the, you've heard again from others about um, why this is important and what we can do. And you've heard also about the value of smartphones for doing this. Uh, and as Gary Gottlieb said earlier today, this is kind of incredible to have a technology that's already ubiquitous. I had to say, in all the years I was at the NIMH, I was really focused on first the power of genomics and then the power of neuroimaging. And um, those are both so exciting, but they are never going to scale to 3 billion people, which is where we are today with smartphone use. And um, this is on its way to 6 billion people, which is just stunning to think that the technology that we dream about for capturing behavioral measurement at, that is really precise and objective is already out there. It's already being used. In fact, most people would say it's, it's a problem that it's so ubiquitous and it's being used so intensively. And for many people, including a wonderful piece that was in the Atlantic Monthly last month, uh, it's considered the source of mental health problems, not the solution. So it's kind of fantastic to think that we could take this thing that's already being overused, if anything, and turn it into maybe something that'll be uh, very helpful. I almost never um, quote members of the Supreme Court, but there is a wonderful quote from Chief Justice Roberts where he says that these have become such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that the proverbial visitor from Mars might conclude that they were an important feature of human anatomy, um, which I think is intriguing. For, for us, uh, where I live and what we are working on, the real promise of this is that um, all of us realize that mental health issues are not, they're not American issues, they're not local issues, these are global. And this is the first technology that really allows global scale. In fact, as you can see from this graph, the greatest growth is in Asia. So what a phenomenal opportunity to be able to do something extraordinary. So what, what does that look like? Well, JP showed you this yesterday, digital phenotyping uh, is the term of art of sort of capturing measures of who we are uh, from our phones. Um, I recently heard a great uh, TED talk where somebody was trying to explain uh, why the phone is such a great tool for this. And the person was talking to, I guess, a room like this, but it was full of people and said, please take out your phone. Uh, please uh, turn it on, activate it, and hand it to the person to your left. And everybody became very uneasy because there's so much there that is going on at all times. Uh, so basically what we're talking about is the raw data that can be collected from sensors, from voice and speech, and from what I called human computer interaction, which is how you keyboard and how you scroll. And the concept is to pull all of that data together through machine learning um, and to get this sort of set of biomarkers that would be digital phenotypes. Um, we are uh, quite focused on this because it gives us most of what we're looking for, the passive, objective, continuous, ubiquitous measures. And of course, as I just mentioned, it's global uh, and pro could provide great ways of predicting and maybe preempting uh, psychosis and depression and suicide. The, um, the, the approach that we've taken at MindStrong is um, to go completely passive. So um, we do collect some of the sensor data that hasn't been as useful for us as this keyboarding data. So there are some 45 different variables that you can collect off the keyboard. And then by looking at this continually over time, 
since we touch our phones thousands of times a day, we're able to get these uh, signal processing transforms that are pretty interesting, that are all time series, giving us something like about a thousand potential biomarkers that we could look at. I don't like calling them biomarkers, but I don't have a better word for it. They're sort of actual cognitive markers. Um, and when you start to look at that data and you pull all these together, um, and the original studies that were done um, were with um, people who have very extensive neuropsychological assessment, about four hours of neuropsychological testing. All of those tests are shown on the left, and these are the, on the right are sort of the, the cognitive constructs that were being measured, very much like what you heard from Jason uh, before in the talk about uh, early Alzheimer's. Um, and what's very cool here is that many of these variables that have to do with you know, going from uh, character to delete or from scroll to click, uh, that we do all the time, we don't think about them, but actually some of them are incredibly well correlated with these cognitive measures we care about. I mean, some of them are kind of obvious. Reaction time on your phone isn't that different from reaction time in the lab. Uh, others, like measuring executive function or verbal memory, might not be so obvious, but there are aspects of what we do on the phone that actually look like that as well. And if you think about that slide that Jason showed about the very poor uh, test retests for just getting the cognitive data out of neuropsych variables uh, in the lab, what's kind of crazy about this is that when you've done this now, we've done this in about 200 patient years of data, uh, you can see that the correlation between these digital features of how you keyboard and how you scroll actually reflect, become very powerful surrogates for many of these neuropsych um, variables. In fact, um, they're better than the test retest, or about the same as the test retest variants for some of those things that we measure in the lab. Not for all of them, but for a lot of them, suggesting that there may be here an opportunity to really begin to capture um, cognitive performance, but in the real world of uh, uh, in situ, as uh, JP said yesterday, and in a way that uh, allows us to do this over time. So we get um, this wonderful reflection of how people are varying over the course of the day or the week or over the course of maybe many years because this is entirely passive. The only thing you need is for someone to use their phone. We're also trying to do this now looking at depression and trying to capture this as a way of measuring mood. These are just the correlations with PHQ-9, uh, which are sort of in the same range depending on whether we're using one variable, which are the blue box, or we're putting 10 of these variables together, where uh, the triangles, where we're getting correlations that are a bit higher. But the bottom line is, in this kind of an approach, adding into it the sensors, perhaps adding in voice and speech, we're beginning to get what we have really been missing in this field, which is this ability to be able to capture behavior uh, in situ, over time, objectively, uh, and in a way that um, uses a, a tool we all have, and yet it doesn't ask anybody to do anything. It's totally seamless, and it's totally uh, consistent with what they're doing already. It's just now taking the data that are already there and beginning to use them for this purpose. The question for us now is, could we begin to also use this to get better diagnostics? Is there a way to develop a kind of precision mental health? Uh, it's probably not gonna be simply a behavioral measure, but if you could begin to put together the cognitive data, neuroimaging data, genomic data, clinical data, does this begin to fill out this RDOC um, vision of providing a kind of dimensional and uh, more comprehensive approach to the way we um, develop these classifiers for what we call mental illness. We don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. We're uh, still chasing that issue. So what I wanted to take now just a couple of moments to talk about is, because this sounds so great, and that's why we're all so excited about it, and that's why you, know, you have people who um, are coming to meetings like this, and you've got so many students who are really eager to get into this field. I think we've got to be honest with where we're at. And that is that um, while this sounds easy, it's remarkably difficult to do. And you've gotten a picture of that, but I'm not sure that we've taken enough time to be fully honest about this. The digital phenotyping idea, which is what our company is very focused on, as many of you are, um, 
it's not so easy to do. When you actually look at the data, what we find is that um, many of those, uh, the signals that we care about work within an individual, not so much between individuals. And you saw an example of that earlier when you were looking at activity uh, and some people, as they get depressed, become more active, some less active, same with geolocation. And some of this stuff works pretty well, but often these are individually personalized kinds of markers. The data themselves are really noisy. There's lots of missing data. And this is why JP made the point yesterday that it's not just it's the acquisition is kind of the easy part. It's the analytics that are going to be really challenging and maybe in some cases prohibitive because there can be so much data missing that you actually don't know where the signals are going to be. I'd say that from a little bit that we have so far, one of the surprising findings is that some of the most important signals are the, like the most silly metadata kinds of signals. Like we know that when people get depressed, they don't charge their phones as much and they don't use their phones as much. So, you know, that's not, there's no Nobel Prize that's coming with that discovery, but it, you know, those are the kinds of findings so far that seem to be the most robust. Um, we used to say that when someone becomes manic, the first biomarker is what's been detected by, their, by your credit card company. And it's a little bit like that. I mean, here, you, you know, you, you, the phone use does change dramatically, but in a way that has to do with how often the phone is used, what time of the day is it first turned on, and, um, and how often it's charged. Uh, and those are the kinds of signals that often look very robust. And the question, I think, for all of us is how much of this really is actionable. And if all we're doing is showing that we can get a correlation with a PHQ-9, let's just use the PHQ-9. I mean, if that's really what we're after here, we have to do much, much better than that. Uh, but what is the right ground truth? And what is, it, what is the use case? And what would be the level of specificity and sensitivity we would need to be able to say, all right, this is actionable? Um, a lot of us are involved in doing the kinds of studies that Roz talked about where we can predict an event. You know, that was the last part of her comments. Uh, and we're very excited about that too. I think it's just spectacular that we'll have the kind of data that would be better than a PHQ-9 because you could say, oh, that's somebody whose PHQ-9 is going to drop like a stone tomorrow afternoon. But what do you do with that data? And who do you tell? And how do you tell? Uh, so these are things that I think all of us need to think about. How does this become actionable? In terms of the mobile interventions, as you know, there are thousands and thousands of uh, companies and apps and um, efforts in this respect. Um, as far as I can tell, none of them has scaled uh, at this point. Huge problems with engagement uh, and getting people to actually use these is a, is a big question. Um, I haven't yet seen a business model that I think is really compelling. So that's part of the reason why we've had this issue with scale. A couple of things that I think are really promising, we didn't, hasn't been mentioned yet, but this attempt to try to come up with some consensus guide. A cyber guide is one example of that. Um, uh, John Torres mentioned the APA effort as well. Uh, I think these are really helpful to have these attempts to at least lay out some standards for the field. We don't have a consumer reports or a Yelp yet, but cyber guide is an attempt uh, to do that. It's just been, um, this comes from the One Mind uh, Institute, but it's now been taken over by a group at Northwestern in CBITS there, um, and I think that'll be a really great opportunity uh, to grow uh, this field and to have, at least for the general public and also for providers, to know what are the levels of privacy protection, what are the, what are the levels of evidence for some of the thousands of apps that are out there. Um, you heard a little bit yesterday uh, about uh, this effort Brainstorm, which is bringing a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs and academics and students together from all across uh, the many parts of academia and the private sector. Uh, kind of fun. I think it's still early days. Uh, it's kind of incredible to me. The last meeting, which I guess was last week, or the first meeting, I should say, which was in the last month, and then there was a second meeting last week, um, and you heard this yesterday, uh, was supposed to go to like 9 o'clock, and it ended at 1 in the morning. I'm not sure whether that involved... Uh, uh, any sort of entertainment or alcoholic beverages, but um, this is what it looked like. 
uh, it, you know, it's exciting. It's, it's interesting to see uh, that there's so much energy. And I, I do think that um, there's an opportunity to get people together in a way that could really take this hype to the stage of hope, which is what I, um, I want to end with. So I thought about um, if we're really going to get serious here about where we want to take this field, we should put out some challenges for ourselves and we should think about um, how is this really going to work? Let's get serious if we really want to prove the value. So uh, in terms of hope, I thought I would take three areas that tie back to um, trying to bend this curve for morbidity and mortality. So suicide, relapse, and psychosis as three areas. One of the things that um, pains me about where we are as a field is we are quite siloed. And as I said at the beginning, there's not going to be a single app for any of this. In fact, in Silicon Valley, we like to joke that we are, we're beyond apps. This is the post-app era. We're moving into other ways of, get, of connecting and getting information. But I think what we really have to construct is not so much a single intervention or a single diagnostic, but we need an operating system. We need a platform. Brings many, many of these things together. Otherwise, we're going to have the same fragmentation problem that I already described for the mental health care system. Um, and if we're going to try to fix that, it has to come from putting many things together. So um, what that really means is you have this measurement, which we call the afferent limb. You've got the interventions through the efferent limb. And then the, the opportunity to use really spectacular uh, analytics um, to try to create that kind of learning uh, pathway, which I talked about. The way I think about the interventions, just to take one minute on this, so because I, you know, we talk about these in it, and there's a lot of I think confusion about the different buckets and the different ways they get developed. But the kinds of platforms I'm talking about are the operating systems are going to have some things that are made really for consumers, and we've heard about some of those in the last couple of days, uh, and those really focus on helping people to for self-management. Um, and some of them are very powerful. Um, I mentioned that I'm on the board of Seven Cups, which does online peer support. They're now engaging 1.5 million people every month, 200,000 listeners online, collecting enormous amounts of information, but also providing enormous amounts of, uh, of peer support. Really interesting. It's, you think, think Alcoholics Anonymous married to Facebook, because that's what they are. Uh, it's really disruptive, really interesting. Um, in some parts of the country, including the state where I live in California, they have more people on their site than the entire mental health care system sees in the brick and mortar resources, which cost us now well over $2 billion a year in our state. So this is like really interesting. And that's all within this consumer space, uh, totally unregulated, completely interesting and disruptive. Uh, and it feels a little bit like, you know, Airbnb going up against Hilton and Sheraton. I mention this because it ties back to that comment about what we're selling ain't what they're buying. They, people are coming on to these online peer support sites. Huge appetite for that. Even in Teresa's data, you saw that. That's what people are looking for. I'm looking for someone who has problems like mine that I can get help from them, and I can help them at the same time. Very empowering to be able to do that. So there's a whole range of things there uh, that need our attention. Tools for the provider, which we mentioned before, like uh, dashboards and digital triage uh, that can be done, and then the whole opportunity to, to integrate care. So all of those are part of this platform, along with the digital phenotyping, the assessments. What we're talking about is then, you know, building an operating system where all of this coexists. How would you apply it? So let's look at suicide as an example. And I put up this goal only because it's the goal that we had at NIMH um, coming out of the um, action agenda that was a government-wide uh, and actually public-private sector effort to reduce suicide back in 2003. 13. I'm just glad it's not 2012 because it was a five-year goal. We haven't made it, but you know now I think we have another year in which we can start to get that 20% reduction. So on the one side, you need to have better risk calculators. You want to be able to predict, and the hope is that we'll have signals from 
um, what we can pull off of a phone. Maybe there'll be things from uh, speech and text. Uh, maybe there are terms that will come out of Google search histories that are going to be great classifiers. We've got this wonderful work from Microsoft, Eric Horvitz's work showing that Bing search histories that were predicting pancreatic cancer, uh, why can't we do the same thing uh, for suicide risk? In terms of the intervention, um, crisis text line is a great example of what you can do for on-demand support just in time. Uh, the opportunity uh, term we use a lot of Google was upskilling, uh, creating technology that allows the volunteer on a suicide hotline to be able to calculate risk as well as a master clinician. Um, I use the, the analogy, since I'm always getting lost, since I live in a new city, that I use Waze all the time. Until I had Waze, I was lost two-thirds of the time, and now I can navigate like a master cabbie. Um, why can't we have tools like that that allow those care extenders that Gary Gottlieb talked about, those people who are going to be providing care uh, in Liberia, but also in parts of Massachusetts, uh, to be able to, either because that this could be something that, for instance, on a hotline, would allow someone to hear the voice, hear the speech, and then you'd get a green light, yellow light, red light that would tell you what the risk was like. Uh, social networks being an important part of this as well in terms of crisis intervention. I mentioned that 52% uh, coming out of an emergency room visit for self-harm, there is no follow-up. Maybe we need to think about uh, the kind of network that might help with the follow-up that would be required. That leads us into postvention as opposed to prevention, uh, and there the opportunity to use technology for much, much better um, management. Uh, the AI nurse, which is a very popular term these days, using bots or using um, uh, someone that would be available uh, at all times, or at least a source that would be available at all times uh, to be able to identify when people are getting back into crisis. Peer support has a role there as well. Relapse reduction, incredibly important, uh, especially for, um, as you heard from, from Ken earlier, for uh, payers and providers who are trying to figure out how to reduce the cost of hospitalization. So are there predictive signals there that we can pick up from digital phenotypes? Um, that essentially would serve as a kind of smoke alarm for when somebody was getting into difficulty, uh, ways of identifying problems with adherence. Can we then create the, uh, the care that will preempt rehospitalization or an ER visit? Um, and again, the role of something that's outside the brick and mortar system around online support and online education might do a lot there. And finally, um, in terms of preventing psychosis, this is a lot more difficult because often here you've got somebody who's not yet been identified as a patient. It's the 14 or 15 year old uh, who's struggling in school, becoming socially isolated. The parents are pulling their hair out. I think I just described about 95% of 14 year olds, but uh, there are some that are clearly gonna go on and being able to identify that, that subgroup of 10 or 20% that uh, are going to have adverse uh, outcomes. Could we develop those signals, whether they're semantic or whether it's through sleep or whether it's again through some sort of digital phenotyping at a population level? Huge ethical issues here. Um, in Australia, there's an effort to do this called future proofing. Super interesting. An entire state, New South Wales, being uh, in an opt out program where every ninth grader, eighth grader, uh, becomes part of a program that's collecting this kind of data to begin to find out whether that will help to reduce suicide and to reduce the onset of uh, psychosis. Um, here again, I think there's a lot of opportunity to develop kinds of interventions that are not pharmaceutical inter interventions, but have to do with building the very cognitive, uh, uh, building on the you know, cognitive resilience and going after uh, the very things that we think are leading to psychosis. And so uh, lots of opportunities there. And then again, the offline or the online effort, efforts uh, for like family to family, which NAMI has built up, or the um, online education is a real possibility. So I'm gonna finish by making just really one other major point, And that is, I think this is like, you know, the first act of what's gonna be a five act play, I hope, 
it's good, we're really at an early stage. If you go back to Scott's early slides from yesterday, the way this whole conference started, I still think it was great, it was brilliant of him to show us that line for uh, neuroimaging and how the number of papers just like went up exponentially after about 1993. Um, for a lot of reasons. The same is true for genomics. Uh, and you, we have a similar slide that I used to use for that purpose. We're still like at that very early stage. And I think we have to recognize um, that that is, that there is this moment of hype. And I remember this for imaging and genomics. Um, we also need to recognize the vulnerability we have now because the opportunity can be lost uh, if we don't do this in the right way. So. I, I want to end by um, showing a slide that I show almost all the time I talk about this topic. And it, it links back to when I was thinking about uh, leaving the government and going to Google. I, I uh, met with some friends of mine who were uh, very, very successful tech entrepreneurs um, and, and became very wealthy, which I should have realized was not the only measure of success. But they had, they had developed a company that really went uh, great guns, not to be named. And I had known them for years. And we, um, I sat down with them. I said, how does this work? What, what's the, <laughs> I don't know anything about uh, A, life in the private sector, and B, life in Silicon Valley and the tech world. And, they, and uh, this was a couple. And she was, he he was kind of unresponsive. She was like very forthcoming. She does a lot of mentoring for CEOs all over the world now. And she said, this is super easy to be successful in, in the tech world. She said, you just need to keep your eye on two things. The first is value. And by that she meant, you've got to have something that solves a problem. So focus on initially efficacy, like in the lab, and then effectiveness and engagement in the population. Um, it's got to be something that people are willing to use. And in your case, she said, because clinicians are already overwhelmed with data, it can't be just giving them data. You've got to give them solutions. So it's got to be all about efficiency. You've got to give them something that requires less time and solves problems for them that doesn't create any burden. And she said, if you can do all that, you're not even halfway there. Because the second piece, she said, is the real key. And it was the thing that took them a long time to learn. And that's trust. And she said, it's so easy to get this one wrong. And if you get it wrong in the beginning, it doesn't matter <laughs> how good your product is. It'll have no value. No one will ever use it. And trust is what we were talking about in the previous session. It's around transparency, agency, responsibility. It's building products not for people or to, to sell to people. Or the, the term we often use uh, in, in medicine is nothing about us without us. It's building these with people, co-developing, identifying what, what's the problem you're trying to solve at the outset and figuring out a way that does this with transparency. This is especially because we're talking about really intimate personal information. People have to have agency, and it has to be used in a very responsible way. And that's easy to say and often difficult to do. We have to think really carefully about what that means. I think for us, it's going to be essential to get this trust piece, which we could call ethical, legal, social piece, uh, clean and clear right at the out outset. This is the time to do it, not after we've stepped in it. Uh, you want to get this right, and you want to think through all the unintended consequences of this issue. This was brought home to me recently when I was, uh, well, I was still at Google. I came to a meeting in Boston. Somebody said they wanted to meet with me. Uh, I didn't recognize the name, and I Googled the person, couldn't find out who they were, uh, but I agreed to meet with the person anyway, and um, and it was somebody from a life insurance company. And they said, we really care about digital phenotyping now. And I thought, oh, yeah, of course, because you want to be able to identify risk in a really clean, serious way. Uh, I get that. I get that, why, why that's useful. And I had to explain that we're in this for healthcare, different use case. Uh, but 
we've, we need to be thinking about this now. A um, lot of interest in digital phenotyping, for instance, in China. Um, and when I started to explore that, it turns out they already have all the data. They're just looking for better algorithms with which to identify this. So, you know, thinking about privacy and transparency and agency, we can't do that soon enough. The way that I've tried to frame this, as I've talked about it with different groups, and I hope others can start to think about it in the same way, is that what we're trying to do is to empower people with better information. And in this case, people is mostly patients and families, but it can also be providers. Um, it can be this whole ecosystem. But if we can think of it in that framework, I think, I think we'll be okay. I think at least that we'll end up with products that actually do have both the value and the trust um, that we want from the get-go. My last uh, slide is actually one I, I use often, and I thought it was particularly um, useful for this meeting as a kind of wrap-up, because it has so much to do with kind of where we're at as a field. Uh, and it's this quote from Bill Gates, that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Somebody mentioned yesterday the iPhone's only 10 years old. Um, I don't know, maybe we won't be using phones in 10 years. Who knows? I mean, there's just an awful lot that can occur in the next 10 years. But I think what we've heard the last couple of days is the opportunity um, to get a technology that can actually truly disrupt uh, this field in a way that is so badly needed. Um, someone said to me recently, if you want to know where to innovate, look for duct tape. Wherever there's duct tape, there's a design problem. Somebody needs to innovate around that. The mental health care system, to the extent that it's a system, is covered with duct tape, right? It's, that's all we've got now is duct tape. It's so fragmented. So we've got an enormous challenge in front of us. There's not a single app that's going to fix this. We've got to be realistic that... Um, there's a bunch of stuff that we can do, places where we can, on the margins, have an impact in the short term. But I think over the next 10 years, there's a chance to potentially truly transform this field more than any other area of medicine. I'm going to argue that it stop, starts with better measurement, but there's also this opportunity to bring in all those people who are currently not in care through these kinds of peer support, consumer-led efforts, and then this opportunity to improve the interventions that we do because we do them with a higher quality. So with that, let me stop. Thank you for your attention, and hopefully we might have a couple of minutes for, for discussion. Thank you.